Hey guys, this is Andy from Laughing in Disbelief. Before talking about the book of Exodus, I'm going to mention that Thomas Westbrook of the Holy Kool-Aid YouTube channel stopped by the Naked Dino podcast. We had a great chat about the atheist YouTube convention that he was part of the Faithless Forum. We also talked about how life could have emerged from the basic chemistry of early Earth, and of course, those pesky, pesky, pedophile Catholic priests. I'm tossing the link below in the description. Before reading chapters 1 and 2 in the book of Exodus, let's talk about the book in its entirety. Jazz hands. It's considered to be the most important book of the Old Testament. God reveals himself. He sets his people free. Laws are given. And the dead kids. We can't forget about the dead kids, right? The name Exodus comes from the Latinized abbreviation of the Greek title Exit from Egypt. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Latin or the Greek. There are more than a few Christians out there who like their Bible in the original English, and I cater to them. Thank you very much. We need to talk about building pyramids and Jews, because there's a lot of that going on in the book of Exodus. A central point of Exodus is that the Jews are slaves and building pyramids for the Pharaoh. And of course, this is nonsense. I'm going to quote from Brian Dunning's article of Skeptoid, you know him. Did Jewish slaves build the pyramids? I'm going to use my quotation voice. Their age, i.e. the pyramids, is well established. The bulk of the Giza necropolis consisting of such famous landmarks as the Great Pyramid of Cheops, 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 and the Sphinx are among Egypt's oldest large pyramids and were completed around 2540 BCE. Most of Egypt's large pyramids were built over a 900 year period from about 2650 BCE to about 1750 BCE. Now the question is, when did Jews arrive in Egypt? That's something we kind of have a good guess about. It wasn't until almost 2000 years after the Great Pyramid received its capstone that the earliest known record shows evidence of Jews in Egypt and they were neither Hebrews nor Israelites. They were a garrison of soldiers from the Persian Empire, stationed in Elephantine, an island in the Nile, beginning about 650 BCE. They fought alongside the Pharaoh's soldiers in the Nubian campaign, and later became the principal trade portal between Egypt and Nubia. Their history is known from the Elephantine papyri, papyri? discovered in 1903, which are in Aramaic, not Hebrew, and their religious beliefs appear to have been a mixture of Judaism and pagan polytheism. Archival records recovered include proof that they observe Shabbat and Passover and also records of interfaith marriages. And perhaps the strangest reversal from pop pseudo history, the papyri, papyri, include evidence that at least some of the Jewish settlers in Elephantine owned Egyptian slaves. So, the pyramids couldn't have been built by Jews because there were no Jews in Egypt at the time of the building of the pyramids. You should check out the rest of the article. I'm putting the link also below in the description down there. But don't look because we're going to get into Exodus chapters 1 right now. The Israelites oppressed. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zublom, and Benjamin, Den, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, the descendants of Jacob, numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. We know that from last time, right? You remember reading through the book of Genesis with me? That was fun. Now Joseph and his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we join our enemies. They will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. Wow, maybe they should build a wall. Maybe they should build that, that would work. Wait. I know, maybe they should just kill kids. That's, I don't want to give it away. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. 
They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all their harsh labor, the Israelites worked them ruthlessly. Ruthlessly. There you go. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names are Shifra and Pua, Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women give childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why? Why have you let the boys live? No, oh, that's a good question. The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. It's like they, the midwives wouldn't have gotten families of their own, I guess, if it wasn't for God's blessings. Who knows? Then Pharaoh gave the order to his people, Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let every girl live. The next section is called the birth of Moses. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi, Levi, we'll go with Levi, married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son when she saw that he was a fine child. That sounds weird, Andy. You shouldn't be saying it like that. A fine child. She hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Okay, not a great plan, maybe, but you know, maybe this is just a mythological structure used in many myths in the Middle East at that time. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take, this is the wet nurse, not the actual mother, I imagine. Take the baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and became, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him, drew, drew him? out of the water. Moses flees to Midian. See, that's the next section here. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian. And I don't know how he killed him, and hid him in the sand. Shallow grave, not going to work out. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Maybe he was hitting him with his own fist, I don't know. The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Maybe it was because he buried him in the sand. That could be it. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. A lot of wells. I guess people are thirsty in the desert. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, because that's his name, R-E-U-E-L, 
He asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian, because of course Moses was then dressed as an Egyptian. An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Reuel asked. His daughters, why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with a man who gave his daughter Zipporah. I'm going to go with Zipporah to Moses in marriage. That's Mrs. Moses, Zipporah. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham because he forgot these things. He forgot the covenant, right? He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. And that's the end of Exodus chapter 2. What could you say about chapters 1 and 2 in the book of Exodus? God didn't care enough to do anything about all those Hebrew babies that got killed. That's what, you know, the Hebrew boys, right? Because a whole gaggle of them died. I mean, couldn't God have just said, stop doing that from the sky in his dad voice and all the craziness stuff? I think so. It sounds like we're traveling on the road of either God can prevent evil and chooses not to, or God can't prevent evil in the first place. And Christians may say, he, he does make all the, you know, make it stop with the killing of the Egyptian babies later on in Exodus. You know, that makes it okay, right? And, and I, as a humanist, I'm left shrugging their shoulders. And I think any humanist would be thinking, well, that's a, that's a pretty crappy plan. If that's the plan, that's the plan. Man, that's crappy. Thanks for watching Upvote if you want to. Subscribe if you wish. Thanks for watching. Godless bless.